morning. My name is Pastor Jackson, and I'm the middle school youth pastor here at the Jefferson Church. We are so excited that you chose to join us online. At the Jefferson Church, we believe that life is better connected. Better connected to Christ, community, and a loving church family. So thank you for choosing to connect with us today. As we dive into this week's service, let's get excited, prepare our hearts for God to move, and join the rest of our church family in worship.
foundation that is Jesus Christ. Amen? Yes. So let's declare this out together.
God, we thank you this morning that you have never failed and you never will. God, that you are a God that meets us here this morning. Whatever we've brought in, whatever the storms have come against us, God, we bring them in here to you right now. We declare that our house is gonna be built not on sand, not on anything that the culture around us is doing, but our foundation is the rock that can withstand anything. Thank you, Jesus, for meeting with us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. During this next song, our prayer team is gonna come forward. If there's anything that you have that you need to join your faith with one of our prayer team members, they would love to pray for you. So let's continue to worship this morning, amen.
got something to tell you that I know you are going to be just elated, excited about. Last week, 33 people gave their life to Jesus. Come on, everybody. Let's give God praise. Thank you, Lord. Amen. How cool is that, huh? That's pretty neat. Hey, before you're seated, tell your neighbor who you're rooting for tonight in the Super Bowl. Super Bowl. Super Bowl. If some of y'all are like, who's playing? You're from Atlanta. It's okay. It's fine. I, I don't think I've, lo- I've watched the Super Bowl since 28 to 3. Anybody remember 28 to 3? Just broke my heart. Hey, it's so good to see everybody here uh, today. If you're here for the first time, first of all, I'm so excited you drove through the rain and the crowd and the traffic and everything to be here today. But man, it's so awesome and we're so thankful. We are also thankful for everyone that's up in the overflow room in the chapel right now. Can we give them a hand, everybody, for being there? Thank you so much for giving up your seat, even families that are here for the first time. You're up there. I just want to say thank you so much for being here. There is a new building on the horizon, everybody. It's coming. It's closer than it's ever been before, and we're going to all be a big family together. Can somebody say amen? Hey, I'm excited about it, but uh, I just want you to know if you're here for the first time, my wife and I, uh, Pastor Chanel and myself, my name is Pastor Nick. We'd love to see you after service right underneath the awning just to shake your hand and say thank you so much for being here today. Uh, It really is an honor that you fought through all you had to fight through to get to the house of God today. Well, let's put our hands together. It's time to give, everybody. Come on, let's give God praise for that. I always try to connect your generosity with what God is doing in our community and around the world and how we are using the resources that God has given us to strengthen the body of Christ. And this week was nothing... um, nothing any less than that we had this amazing opportunity to bless a family in Jackson County his name is Ben Hildebrandt and the Hildebrandt family uh, Ben is the director for Fellowship of Christian Athletes in Jackson County and Banks County so he has other people underneath him but he is the director for Jackson and Banks County for FCA and how many of you know FCA is basically a conduit that we have that gets the gospel into high schools and middle schools and allows them to connect back to the local church. And we're so thankful for this organization. Uh, but what they call them, they don't call them employees. FCA, they're known as missionaries. And here's why, is because they have to raise all of their own support. There is not some bank account from FCA headquarters that they get a paycheck from, like some of us would with our jobs. They have to raise all of their own support. So their families are basically, um, uh, uh, it's, it's basically all dependent upon people's generosity. And so as a church, we sponsor FCA and it goes to ministry. It helps do fields of faith and it helps give Bibles and send kids to camp and all those kinds of things. It's really, really great. But oftentimes, the man in charge, if money is ever given, it doesn't go to him. It flows through the ministry because Ben is a really selfless person. And if there's one area of, of, that I felt like we could help Ben and his family as a church, it was with his car. His first car that I saw him with when I knew him first, it was he called it the Blueberry. How many of you know if you name a car, that's usually not a good sign, you know, because it, it's probably not the, like the best thing in the world. And then he got a car that was the very first Chevy Trailblazer, the very first year model. So that was 20 plus years ago that he had that. And actually, just recently, one of the tires fell off of it. So he was having some car mechanical issues and problems. And so because of your generosity, we were able to bless his family. And I'm going to show you a video here in just a minute. Father, thank you so much. For the generosity in this house. Thank you, Lord, that it goes to amazing families, amazing people, and it helps so many around Jackson County, Jefferson, and around the world. God, we pray that you bless the gift and the giver today as they tithe and give in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, you guys watch the screen for me. something that we wanted to let you guys know. We are so thankful for what both of you do for Jackson County, for what you do for our schools and for our students. And we have been thinking of a way to just try to bless you guys in the best way possible. And we want to bless you guys with something today, if that's okay. And I want you to know that this envelope right here is very important because that envelope, y'all come this way, come this way, right here facing TV. Okay. That right there is the key because you're about to go pick up 
That's an awesome family, and I'm telling you, uh, he, he texted me this morning. He said, I'm still crying. He said, I just get in, and I'm so blessed uh, to be in this. It was, it was one of the best used trucks, I think. Uh, it was the first one that we looked at, and the, just the Lord um, just gave us such favor. Even the dealership knocked off a couple thousand dollars just because they found out what we were doing. Mm -hmm. And so he got a great, great used truck. So if you see somebody in a white truck with a big old white smile in the front seat, you know who it is. It's, it's going to be Ben. And uh, so if you see him. Uh, just hug his neck, you know, and even even if you want to continue uh, as a church, we support FCA. You can do that individually as well, and we can give you more information on that. But um, I'm just so thankful to be attached to a church that's generous like that, that we do things like this. Um, there's tissues underneath the seats, just in case y'all need them. Uh, there's, we do things like this uh, year-round. We want to continue to do them and do them more, more occasion, and just let it be something that our church does is that we give uh, we just bless people, uh, not not because of any particular reason, but just because of God that the Lord told us to. And so I'm so thankful to lead a church as generous as you guys. Um, before we move on, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, I uh, as as a as we've grown over the last eight years, uh, I remember when the first service, this room um, had about 80 people in it, and and that's where it all began. And now, thank the Lord, we're in four services, two of them with overflows. We're looking at the first service, potentially having to have an overflow there, too. So it's just like God's done amazing things. With that, there's growing pains and going, growing problems, and that's fine, too. Uh, but we're going we're gonna to do our very best to make sure that each and every individual can be touched and reached um, in this house and in our community. The only problem is when everybody looks for one guy to do all that, it's pretty difficult. Um, I, I want to say uh, last uh, couple of Sundays, we've been in the 21, 22, 2300 range of people coming to the house of God. How cool is that, everybody? That's pretty neat, right? And um, 33 salvations last week. God's doing amazing things. But for one person to have to go do all the hospital visits, for one person to make all the phone calls, for one person to have all the meetings, for one person to go do all the funerals, for one person, it's just, it's a lot. And if that's all I, and if that's the only responsibility I had, I would have a full-time 40, 50, 60 hour a week job just doing those things. But um, our staff kind of recognize that, that we need to get ahead of this a little bit, especially moving into the new facility. So what we are doing is we are creating an email address. Uh, it's prayer at jefferson.church. And this is the way, this is our first crack at trying to kind of um, get to this, this problem that we're having. We are creating a team. It's called the Care and Compassion Team. And this team, their job is going to be when the pastoral staff is not able to touch and reach everybody in a given week, this team is going to be sent out. And they're going to 
do some hospital visits and make some phone calls and check on some people. And so there's two things I want to ask for. Number one, if you're going into surgery, if you're sick, if you're in the hospital, and not just you, maybe it's your family. Maybe you've got family in a retirement home. Maybe you've got somebody that you know that's sick, that's um, a friend just in the community that you say, hey, it would be great to have somebody from church go and check on them. I want you to email prayer at jefferson.church because sometimes phone calls fall through the cracks. Sometimes Facebook messages uh, like people will write on Facebook, been in the hospital for two days and like we had no idea. So we're trying to give you the opportunity to let us know so that we can uh, provide that service for you. So prayer at jefferson.church, that will, you can do that and tell us where you're going to be, what's happening, what's going on in the situation, all those kinds of things. The second thing is that this is a team <clears throat> that we are developing, <clears throat> excuse me, that we are developing so what I want to ask you to do is if, if you feel gifted in the area of compassion and you feel like you're really, really good at, at sitting with people and understanding needs and, and listening and, and being uh, just compassionate towards others, we want to ask you to be a part of this team as well. We'll train you. We'll help you just to be the hands and feet of Jesus. And you're also helping your pastor because, um, you know, if, if I'm at the hospital every night, I can't be a dad. If I'm at the hospital with somebody every night, I can't be a husband. And I just, I want to say thank you so much for understanding this. And uh, this just being a part of the process that we're doing to try to fix this issue. So I'd love for you guys to be a part of that, uh, either on the team or just email us. And uh, you can jot that down. And next time something comes up, um, just email us. Um, part two of Never Ending Love is um, directed specifically towards marriages and I realize that in a, in a room this size and up in the overflow right now, I realize in a rooms, rooms of this size that uh, we're not all married. You know, some of us are single. Some of us are divorced. Uh, some of us ha are widows or widowers. And, and, and in that under understanding, I want you to know that I really try to prepare these messages, not for just one single um, lane of life, but this is a, a, a series and a message for all relationships uh, in a very broad <coughs> way. <clears throat> and so what I want to do is I want to help you guys um, with something very specific. But today we are talking about marriage in, in a broad way, but in a specific way as well. And I want to start off with this. Um, in, in my house, we have, um, we have two TVs in the house, and um, they're both Roku. Why? Because we go to Walmart and get cheap high sense. Come on, somebody. You might know what I'm talking about. We get, we get the cheap TVs. And I wanted all the same remotes. I didn't want the RCA remote. I didn't want the Samsung remote. I wanted one remote. So every TV we ever get is high sense, cheap, Roku remote. Um, if there's one thing in our home that we lose all the time, it's the remote. In two years, no lie, I have bought 18 remotes. In two years. I tell the kids, I tell everybody, I say, this is where the remote goes. Somebody told me, you know what you need to do? Zip tie it to a two by four, you'll never lose it again. I thought, that's a great idea. Anyway, um, just, that, was, that was for free, you can have that one. So anyway, um, I, I bought all these remotes and I just keep them in a stash. So when we lose one, it's all the same, Amazon, you know, all generic, boom, it, it works, no problem. Put batteries in it, we're good. And then you like, you turn the house upside down or you flip the living room or something like that and you find three or four remotes just sitting in crazy places. One time we saw it and found it in a Dorito bag. It was crazy. So it's just, Houston did that. So it's just crazy stuff, right? Well, what that has shown me is that nothing really stays where you put it. Like you, you, you find a place, you find a spot, nothing really stays where you put it. And it, it's a greater kind of expanse of a look on life. That if, if you expect everything to be right where it was when you left it, it's never going to be the case. And, and, and not only does that really respond to our marriages, but it responds to life in general. How many of you know your friendships don't stay where you put them? Like if you don't put a little intentionality behind it, if you don't really work towards some friendships, those friendships aren't going to last very long. Your health, <laughs> come on somebody, your health doesn't stay where you put it. I mean, when I was 18, I had a suit, but I don't, have, I don't have nothing now, right? And so it's just like, it doesn't stay where you put it. You have to have intentionality towards certain things in your life, your finances. Nothing stays where you put it. It's always going to move. So you have to be intentional with your friendships. You got to be intentional with your children and your time spent with them. And today, you got to be intentional with your marriage. You, come on, you can't just set your marriage on default and walk away. You can't just set your marriage on autopilot and walk away. You've got to be intentional with it. Your marriage, your communication, your connectivity, your sex life, your date nights, all those encompassing our marriages, everything relationally has to be intentional. 
And anytime you set it on autopilot or anytime you set it on default, it's never the way it was supposed to be. It never stays the way it was when you left it. And I just feel like from now almost a decade of sitting down with couples going through turmoil and issues and problems, one of the biggest things I see is that many of us in this room are going through seasons in our marriage, difficult seasons, difficult times. No matter what stage of life you're in, there, there are difficult moments in our marriage. And oftentimes, it's just like, well, I'm just going to table this for right now, and we never go back to it. That we have to be intentional with our marriages, intentional with our relationship, and not put our marriages on default. And I would just say, if you want a great experience in marriage, default's not the way to go. If you want a great experience in your relationships, putting it on autopilot is not the way to go. And we can talk all about the greatness of marriage and the wonder of marriage and the success of marriage. And we do that. We, we talk about how amazing marriage is. But what I have found in life is that I learn very little from my successes. I learn a lot more from my hardships. I learn a lot more from the difficult seasons and the storms and the, the problems that I go through. If everything in my marriage was perfect, I wouldn't be the husband that I am right now. I wouldn't grow as an individual. But because things in our life have not been perfect here and there, we have grown to be better as spouses and better as followers of Jesus Christ. Can somebody say amen? So that's what I want to ask for us today, that we look into that idea of not just the successes of marriage, which we can talk about. Everybody can smile and get out of here. And it's great. It's Valentine's week. Woohoo! You know, it's fantastic. But I want to talk about some hardships, maybe some shortcomings that we have in our relationships. And so this week, I just want to talk about some hardships of marriage that you're possibly dealing with. And we're just going to begin with a very, very simple thought. So Father, I'm asking that you'd help me today, um, specifically about what I'm getting ready to talk about, specifically the first half of what I'm getting ready to talk about. Lord, that the walls that we build in our relationships, those can stand for a little while, but if we build a wall between us and the Holy Spirit, between us and God's word, between us and a relationship with Jesus, those things affect us so quickly and so radically. And so I'm praying that today, marriages in this room, no matter what phase you're in, good, bad, freshly married, married for 30, 40 years, whatever it is, I'm just praying that we would put down the walls, let the walls down that are between us and the Holy Spirit and allow him to speak to us about the walls we have between our spouses. I'm asking that you'd help us to do that today in Jesus' name. And everybody said, thank you, DJ. Appreciate you, man. Um, the, the very simple thought that really starts our conversation today, starts this sermon, is the fact that as men and women, we are different. How many of y'all know that, right? We different. Can I tell you something? I'm very thankful that my wife and I are different. I'm so thankful my wife doesn't look like a guy. I'm so thankful for that. I love the fact, I love the feminin femininity, femininity of my wife. I am very attracted to the fact that she is a female. There are things about her that I just love because she is a female. We're different in a lot of ways. And I want you to know that, that, that we're different, but at the same time, according to the word of God, we are equal. That there are men and women. God gives grace and love and has died for all men and women. The Bible says that he died for everybody. And then it says that he made them in his image. He wasn't just talking about men. He was saying men and women. He made them in his image. So we are image barriers, uh, image carriers, I should say, image bearers of the image of of Jesus Christ. So God made them together. We are different, but we are equal. As a matter of fact, there are only two things that you need to know about women. Only two things. I don't know what they are, but there are two things. <laughs> if Guys, if you ever figure out what those two things are, you could be a bajillionaire right now making money. And ladies, if you want to tell us what those two things are, that would be amazing. It would help us guys out a lot. But I would argue that even women don't really know. Even, even men and women, like we're, we're so different and it's just an entangled web that sometimes seems frustrating, but I want you to see it's really a beautiful process and a beautiful um, engagement that God has given us, and, and, and that's what I want to talk about. So as I said last week, we are going to deal with four hardships, two from the women and two from the men. So I'm going to start ladies first, and I'm already sweating, because basically... <laughs> I'm getting ready to tell a bunch of women what you're doing wrong. And that's never a good place to be. But I want you to know I'm doing this with boldness and standing on the word of God. But I'm shaky. I'm a little scared. I really I have sweat dripping down my back. Like, I'm sweating. I'm not, I'm, 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 I just hope I have friends when all this is said and done. That's all I'm, that's all I'm guessing. Um, I think that the very first thing, just to get right to it, the very first thing that as ladies, 
that sometimes we get ahead of ourselves and sometimes there are some issues in our marriage caused because, number one, you have to find your identity in God alone. And here again, maybe this is coming from me sitting down with couples and me, sit, my wife and I sitting down with a, a lady or, or I'm sitting down with guys. And as we're talking and as I'm reading the word of God, I see kind of the same pattern over and over and over. And so maybe these are the top two things that I'm seeing. Maybe, that, maybe that's what this is coming from. But what I have found is that a lot of ladies in our society and even in our church, let's just put it that way, in our church, a lot of ladies, they find their identity in so many other things that's not God. Like God is just, God's a trailer to the whole, to the whole train. You know what I'm talking about? He's just, he's part of the ride. He's part of the journey. When we stop, I'll get out and check on him, make sure everything's okay. Then I'll get back and do what I got to do. And so many times as women, you guys, I almost said we guys, you guys, um, you guys find an identity in so many other things and it's not in God alone. And, and I would say this too, it's not just women. Guys can have this problem too. And we're, I'm not just singling anybody out necessarily. But what I want to do is I want to go to the Bible, and if you brought your Bibles, we're going to be in Genesis 2 and Genesis 3. So I want you to turn there right now, Genesis 2 and Genesis 3. If you don't know where Genesis is, I'm so glad you're at church today. Thank God you're here. That's fantastic. Genesis 2 and Genesis 3. Um, the first passage we're going to go to, what I, what I decided to do for today's message is instead of saying, hey, don't you want the biblical marriage? <laughs> Can anybody think of a biblical marriage that was a good marriage, you know? Like, I wanted the biblical marriage. Which one are you talking about? Abraham and Sarah? Yeah, he tried to give his wife away to Pharaoh. That, that ain't, that, no, we ain't doing that. How about David and Beth? She, but, nah, probably not the best one to do either. Like, like, I don't really know if there is an example of a great marriage in the Bible, but what I wanted to do is go to the first relationship, the first marriage, the first union that God put together. And it says in chapter 2, verse 21, it says, so the Lord God caused man to fall into a deep sleep. That's my favorite verse in the whole Bible, everybody. I love that verse. I'm claiming that for Sunday afternoon in Jesus' name. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man. Watch this. And then he brought her to the man. He brought her to the man. Her first moment of consciousness, her first moment of creation, and her first moment of existence was not in front of Adam. Her first moment, her first relationship that she ever had with anybody was not with her husband. It was with God because God created her. God molded her together. God made her and knitted her together. And basically, he is saying in this little verse, this little passage that we can fly right over pretty easily, he's saying that I didn't attach her to the man first. I attached her to me first. As God, he was saying, I made her in my image, and I was the first relationship in her life. And I would argue that woman's first relationship, females, the first relationship ever in the history of womanhood was with God. Adam was asleep, and the Bible says that he made her, uh, he brought her to the man. And I would just say that, ladies, if you want to have a successful marriage, if you want to have a good marriage, you need to put God first in your life. And somebody say amen. You need to put God first in your life. And I know that this isn't just for women. You, you can apply this to men as too. Uh, apply this to the men as well. But I just want you to know that as, as, as women, God is trying to show you something in the very first two chapters of the Bible. He's saying your identity is not in your husband. Your identity is not in your children. Your identity is not in your job. Your identity is not in your home and how Pinterest perfect it looks. Your identity is not in your career. Your identity is not in your wealth. Your identity is not in what you see in the mirror. That is not who you are. God says, I have established who you are. And anytime you try to find significance, importance, or identity in anything other than God, it's going to cause issues and problems in your life. And I would argue everybody's marriage in this room would be better served if we, and specifically just in this moment, women, if you would put God first in your life, if you would get your identity from God, not your husband, not your kids, not your home, not your appearance. And for some reason, women really struggle with this idea of, uh, of self-worth. You know, like I, I will just say it like this. In our home, 
Both of my older girls, they look in the mirror all the time before they walk out the door. There are times I don't look in the mirror at all. You know, she, she, she do this, she do this. I walk out, girl, I know I look good. You know, I, I just walk out. I got, like, and I'm just saying that some, sometimes there's this confidence measure that women are trying to get, that women are trying to, am I good enough? Can I tell you something? Sometimes you may look at your husband and get the wrong answer. Look at your kids. Look at your dirty house. Look at your life. Look at all the chaos that's going on. And when you look in that mirror, oftentimes you don't see beauty. But every single time you put God first in your life and read what he has to say about you, you all you see is that you are good enough God does love you God puts you as the apple of his eye you are in the palm of his hand and social media and 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 your and your husband and your children and your home life and all those things so many times they speak louder than what the word of God speaks over our own life and God says you are mine and when I made you girl you look good like that's what God says and matter of fact, in the book of Song of Solomon, you might think the Bible's G-rated. Read the Song of Solomon. That thing is PG-13 at best, everybody, okay? It's a romance novel. And here's what he says. He says, you are altogether beautiful. Speaking about women, this woman in particular, you are altogether beautiful. There is no blemish in you. That's the way the Father looks at us, looks at you, not us, <laughs> looks at you as Women, Psalms 139, verse 14, I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. It doesn't matter what social media says I do or don't have. It doesn't matter what my relationship is looking like right now. It doesn't matter where I am on the corporate ladder. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, and I know this full well. But many times, the reason our relationships suffer is because we fail to place God as the head of everything in our life. I had a teacher tell me this one time. If, 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 if your life is a train, God's got to be the locomotive. If he's not, everything else is going to fall off. Everything else is going to grind to a halt. Everything else is going to have problems stopping or going. If God's not primary, if God's not the beginning of everything, we've got to put God first in our life. And that's why Matthew 6, is so key and vital, not just to ladies, but to everybody in this room. He says, you've got to put God first. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God, not your children, not your husbands, not your homes, not your physical appearance. Seek first. First, the kingdom of God, and when you do that, everything you're worried about, God will take care of it. Everything that you need, God will take care of it. All the verses before verse 33 are all about worry, all about issues, all about things that keep you up at night. And I'm telling you, if you would put God first in your life, you would sleep a lot better. Can somebody say amen? So I need to say that the first step out the gate talking to women and seeing a hardship or a problem that I see in marriages is that, ladies, stop finding your identity in your spouse. That there, there's a reason why you're unhappy, because you are bla you're placing everything on a man that's fallible. You're placing everything on a man that is not God. And, and people say all the time, oh, he's just my rock. No, he's not. Jesus is your rock. Jesus is your foundation. God is the firm foundation of your life. Everything else is just circumstance, and everything else is just relationships and situations. But I'm telling you, God needs to be the primary objective of your life. Somebody say amen. Okay? So that's, that's number one. I'm halfway through, and then I can stop sweating. I'm feeling some glares in the room right now. Just, just pray for me, everybody. Number two, a lot of times... I think, it's, I think it's pretty clear that there's a, a distinct difference between men and women, that women can be emotional. Men don't understand these emotions, and so they can seem kind of hard and, and indignant and just, you know, well, it's just rolling their eyes. We'll just, but, but women are kind of known for being emotional, I would say. And, and basically what the idea behind it is this, is that I want to encourage you, don't allow your emotions to take over your spiritual life. Don't allow your emotions to dictate your life. Don't allow your emotions to dictate what you do, where you go, and what you decide upon. Allow the Word of God to be the spiritual leader. Allow the Holy Spirit to be the spiritual leader in your life. You're like, Pastor Nick, where does this come from? I would argue that the very first sin ever committed in the Garden of Eden, Genesis chapter 3, was because Eve chose emotions over spiritual things. She chose emotional intelligence over spiritual, the word of God. And in verse 1 of chapter 3, it says, Now the serpent was more crafty than all of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say 
you must eat from any tree in the garden. The woman said to the serpent, we may eat from every fruit in the tree of the garden, but God did say you must not eat from that tree that is in the middle of the garden, or you must or not touch it, or you will die. So basically, she, she confronted the enemy. She used God's word. She says, hey, that's it, that's it. And you would think the enemy would just leave her alone. Well, he came back, and he goes, you will not die. He says, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be more like God knowing good and evil. Notice, the serpent, the devil, did not come after Eve and try to appeal to her need for bad things. He did not try to appeal for her need for evil things. He appealed to her need for being more like God. He appealed to her need to be more holy, more spiritual. And he said, listen to me. He said, God is really not providing everything for you. He's holding back. He's holding this at bay, so to speak. And in verse 6, the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom. So she took some and she ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her. We'll talk about that in a second. And he ate it. So the serpent came to Eve and basically said, God's holding this out on you. He's holding out on you. He's not giving you something that you need. And there was this belief, and I believe this is where she, she kind of messed up. She believed this. God's holding out on me. There's something I don't have. She began to lose her identity in God providing for her, and she, she forgot that she was bear, a bearer of his image, and she began, watch this, she began to focus on the one thing that she thought she needed but did not have. And instead of trusting God, she trusted her emotions. Instead of trusting God, she trusted culture. Instead of trusting God, she trusted outside voices. And I believe this is where the emotional began to take over the spiritual. Why? Because Eve gave in to the way she felt. Can I tell you something? Not just for ladies, but for everybody. Your feelings will lie to you. Emotions will lie to you. They will make you think you are something more than you are or less than you are. They will give you more courage in areas where God's saying, being humble. I'm, I'm just telling you, your emotions and your feelings will lie to you. And in this moment, Eve's knowledge of God's word and Eve's relationship with God, again, fell prey to the fact that she gave in to her emotions and she gave in to the way she felt. Rather than turn and, and stand on the truth that was found in God's word, she ate of the fruit. And ever since then, sin entered the world. And it was all because she believed the lie of her emotions. Can, can we just agree, ladies, that sometimes emotions play a, a role in your decisions? Emotions play a role in your relationship. Can we just say that emotions play a role in whether we sleep or not, whether we're in a good mood or not, whether we love our husband that day or not, whether we want to be with our kids or Like, emotions play a role in all these things. And because she believed that lie of the, the, the emotions were telling her, she said, I need this, and God is not enough. And many times, that's what happens in our marriages, is that, ladies, you allow the emotions to take over the spiritual. You allow the emotions, the lies, to trump the truth. That's, that's, why, that's why there's adultery rampant in marriages today. And actually, it will shock you, the percentage of, of the people in the marriage that, that initiate the adultery is not men. It's women. And it's because the emotions are there, and the emotions rise to a place where they feel like, I deserve this, I need this, it's not being provided for me in whatever way, shape, or form. And instead of standing on the truth of God's word and standing on what he says and trusting him, we believe the emotions of our life. You, you look in a mirror and you say, well, I'm not, I'm not pretty. You know, I, I, I'm not what I need to be. And that's emotion talking over the spiritual aspect when God says, hey, I made you beautifully and perfect just the way you are. It's that idea that you have to undermine your husband, that you have to put him down in front of other people. That's, that's the emotional overriding the spiritual because biblically the Bible says the man is the head of the house. And in that idea when we undermine it, when we put him down in front of others especially, that's the emotions of the situation overriding the spiritual. And that's a big responsibility that we need to know about. So ladies, that's your two things. Now the fellas. I have a little more experience in this area. I kind of understand a little bit more kind of on a, on a ground base level with, with the guys in the room and just, just two issues with men as it pertains to marriage. And I just want to help you with this. I hope, I hope all this is, 
is at least life-giving to you, and you can have a further conversation when you leave here today. Guys, number one, you need to be in the relationship, not just in a marriage. Does that make sense? You need to be in the relationship, not just in a marriage. Oftentimes, because men come home and, you know, they, they work so hard and women work too, and, you know, but, but men, we're just, you know, we're bringing home the bacon, we're frying it up in a pan, like all that kind of, like that, whatever that song is. Like, like all that's going on, I know I'm talking about a woman, but anyway, um, uh, all, all that's moving forward and like we're, we're doing, we're carrying the load, all that, and all of a sudden, it, it, a scenario happens where, you know, we can just put our relationship on default. We can just put our, our marriage on autopilot. And just say, you know what, I'm, I'm going to do what I'm going to do. You go over there, and just for a time, let's not connect. Let's not be involved in a relationship. And what happens is you come home, and these ladies are trying to tell you about the amazing, complex, intricate things that have happened in their day. <laughs> and we just shut down. A real study said men say 15,000 words a day. Women say 45,000 words a day. And I feel like, ladies, you save all 45,000 words until we get home. (sighs) But guys, you got to be up for the challenge. You've got to be in the relationship. You, 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 can't, you can't just put your, your marriage and your relationship on autopilot. And, 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 and I, I felt this way when I was writing it down. Be a part of her life instead of just being a part of a marriage. Be involved. Be interested in things she's interested in. Be, be talking. I, I'm telling you, just instead of faking it and going, uh-huh, uh-huh, yeah, uh-huh, uh-huh, be involved in her life and be involved in what's going on because when you do that, you're in the relationship. Proverbs 18, 22 says, he who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. So here's this blessing and favor that God wants to give you because you found a wife, you found a good thing, but you're just putting your marriage on autopilot. And it's just, well, it just is the way it is. We're just roommates. You know, we just, we just decided a long time ago we're just going to go our separate ways but stay for, together for the kids. Whatever that sounds like, I'm telling you that God, as men, God has given you a blessing and a good thing in the form of your wife. But if you are not linked up, hooked up to it, and involved in the relationship, you're not tapping into that blessing. And you yourself will not be blessed. It follows the, the saying of 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. Watch what Peter says. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way. When you come home, sit down at the table and say, how was your day? What happened? Put the kids to bed. Turn the TV off. How was your day? What happened? How, uh, in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you and the grace of this grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Boy, that sounds really important to me. Because you're praying prayers for your family. I know you are. You're praying prayers for your business. You're praying prayers for your health. You're praying prayers for your kids. And all those prayers are great. But according to what 1 Peter just said, they will or will not be answered in accordance with how you treat your wife. Boy, it sounds like we got to get that important pretty quickly. It sounds like we got to make that change pretty quickly. And guys, we have all of our hobbies. Come on, we got golf, we lift weights, we go to movies, we, we do all the things, but I just want to ask you one, one quick question. Every guy in the room, watch this. What do you do with your wife? Not for her, <laughs> not in spite of her. Come on, somebody. What do you do? What do you do with your wife? What time are you spending specifically devoted to being with your wife. And I'm not saying this as a blanket statement because I don't know what I'm talking about. My wife and I, we've been married 15 years, and it was right about the middle of that, right about the time we came here to this church. And um, I can just remember we were going through a, a, a rough patch, so to speak, in our marriage. And how many of you know we never fight. We have intense fellowship. Come on, somebody. You know what I'm talking about. Like we've, we've never fought a day in our life. We've had intense fellowship. That's how we coin it around our house. And, and we were having a season of intense fellowship. And it, was just, it just wasn't clicking. Something just wasn't working. And come to find out, you know, when you're in ministry, you, you, you don't have time for everything. 
but you try to because you have a heart for people. So you go to the hospitals, you do the funerals, you do the weddings, you do the marriage counseling, you stay after, you work late, you show up early, you do all the kind. Yesterday, um, yesterday I, I woke up at, f- at 4.30, and I didn't get back home until six, uh, 5 o'clock that night. And that's, that's another story for something else. But I, 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 just, I want you to know that ministry is not just this cushion job, and she, more than anybody, understands that that's the case. And the Lord convicted me. He said, why aren't you resting? Why aren't you taking a Sabbath? I said, okay, God, I'm going to take a Sabbath. So public service announcement, I no longer take Mondays off. Some of y'all see me doing things on Mondays, and you're like, you're disobeying the Lord because you're supposed to take Mondays off. And I used to call them marriage Mondays. Now we swapped it to forever Fridays. So Fridays, don't call me, don't text me, don't DM me, don't email me. I will not respond. Why? Because on that day, I'm putting God first, and I'm doing things with my wife. And that's something that I feel like as men, we need to take control of our time, Take control of our jobs before those things begin to take control of us. We put our life, our marriage on autopilot and on default. The second thing is men as a society, I think we're moving towards being passive. God did not create you to be passive. God did not create you to take second in command. God didn't create you to to uh, not to, to, to not take the charge and take the role. God created you in, to be active, but I feel like in a society where we have a lot of fatherless homes, and I really feel like that's a, that's a pandemic, that's a problem, have a lot of fatherless homes where women have to take the lead. They have to be mom and dad, good cop and bad cop, provider and nurturer, that women have kind of taken this lead because men have abdicated that space in society. And then I'm telling you, I have seen a a real problem more and more. Men have become more and more passive, not only in their life, but in their home. Their wife opens their Bible up more than the husband does. Their wife prays more than the husband does. You're here at church because your wife wants you to be here and the mom wants you to be here, not because dad says it's a staple in our home, that's what we're going to do. There's this passive understanding that God did not put inside of us. It's because we are moving with culture. And I'm just going to go ahead and tell you, when it comes to being passive, ultimately it comes down to, <laughs> I'm not going to have any dude friends at the end of this. When it, when, it, when it comes down to it, we're just lazy. We'd rather zone out on our phone. We'd rather watch a TV show. We'd rather uh, uh, have phones, shows, bros. Come on, poet didn't know it. Shows and bros. We, phones. <laughs> Shows, bros, hobbies, that's what we would rather do. And then I hear people say, I come home tired. I come home doing all the things I'm supposed to do, and I just want a moment just to chill and relax and recoup. That's what I want. Can I tell you something? Especially if you're a father, you don't have that luxury right now. There will come a time. It's called retirement, everybody. There will come a time. But right now, you've got kids. Right now, you've got a wife that needs you. My brother... Jeremy, he told me something one time that I will never forget. He said, when I get home at night, when it's bedtime, I want to be so dead dog tired that I don't have time for any other foolishness. In other words, I wake up, I do what I'm supposed to do, I take care of myself, I go to work, and then when I get home, I'm still on the clock because I've got to be dad, and I've got to be husband, and I've still got to be on, so that by the time, and I have found that majority of the shenanigans and the foolishness that happen in the marriage life pertaining to the man happen in the later hours of the evening when you're so worn out and so tired and your defenses are down. That's when you get relationships with women online you shouldn't be having. That's when you look at your phone when you have no business looking on that site or looking on that social media or that TikTok video. That's when things like that begin to happen and it rips the fabric of your marriage apart. So I took that upon myself. I don't do it all the time, but I try to live by that motto. I'm going to be so tired by the end of the day that I'm going to sleep so well because I don't have time for anything else. God made us to be active, not passive. Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. It says, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden so that he could work it. Work it. Now, you would think Garden of Eden, perfect case scenario, redeemed Maui. Come on, somebody. Like, like that. That's what the Garden of Eden looked like. You would think, just put your feet up in an easy chair, sit back, take in the waves and the breeze and the you know, ocean sounds. You think that's what he would do. No, no, no. In perfection, in a perfect world, God put the man to be active and work and gave him responsibilities, take initiative, find fulfillment in his work, bring order to chaos, create as his creator creates, and as it is a garden, the nature of caring for it, it will produce something. 
And that's what happens. Watch this. As men, we get passive because nothing is being produced, and we feel like we can't do anything about it. You are the answer to your own problem. You've got to be active. You've got to pull away from passivity. And I feel like, just listen to me, lean in for just a second. We're almost done. DJ's coming. As a society of men, we are being pulled to passivity. We are being pulled to zone out on that TV show while your kids are still young and need you. We are being pulled to zone out on that phone, pulled to work extra and not spend time with our kids. Can I tell you that as, as, as I thought about this yesterday, again, I got up at 4.30 in the morning. I did not get home till 5 o'clock last night. And you know what my boys both said? Daddy, can we play baseball? I did not want to play baseball. I wanted to sit, zone out, and eat and go to bed. But there was about maybe 30, 45 minutes of daylight left. And I don't do this all the time. I'm not trying to tell you I'm better than anybody. But I got out there and I played baseball with my kids. Why? Because I want to be so tired at the end of the day. I want to be so exhausted by the end of the day because of the activity that God has called me to. But I really feel like passivity, being stagnant, being lazy, is something that the enemy uses in guys specifically. And I think it happened in the Garden of Eden. <laughs> I don't think this is a new problem. I think this is something that we, we attach ourselves to pretty easily because it's there. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 6, I told you I'd come back to it. It says, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some of it and ate it. Watch this. She also gave some to her husband who was... Every picture you've ever seen, Eve is by herself with that snake, right? Holding a piece of fruit. Every, every, every portrait you've ever seen this. But biblically, that's not accurate. Why? Because Adam was, he was there with her when she took the fruit. And instead of being active and saying, hey, baby girl, we don't need this right now. Hey, this isn't what God says. We need to obey God. Hey, servant, instead of doing that, <laughs> instead of doing that, instead of doing that, passivity he didn't take action amen you are to be active in pursuing your wife pursuing a relationship with God put him first pursuing the relationship with your wife pursuing being a father to your kids and being the guard of your home if something's in your house it didn't just get there you allowed it in the door men take responsibility listen to me if something is in your house and you don't like it, it did not just show up there. It got there because it made it through you. That's why in my house, my kids, my one child who has a phone, there are certain apps she will not have. I'm just going to go ahead and tell you. Snapchat will never be on that child's phone. TikTok will never be on that child's phone. Why? She will survive. I promise you. I promise you. There are just things I'm not going to allow in my house while she's there. There are certain apps on our TV station we have deleted. Why? I'm not going to let my kids watch that. I'm not going to let them veg out all the time in front of a gaming system or in front of the TV all the time because they're learning culture through those things. I, I, I'm not going to allow horror movies in my house, demonic horror movies in my house. I'm not doing that. Why? I am the guard. I'm the post. I'm, I'm the one that stands at the post of the doors of my home, and I actively defend my house against the enemies that are coming against me. But ultimately, when it comes to marriage, I feel like we talked this whole time about hardships, and I, I want to help you with what a good marriage looks like in the simplest way possible. Hey, Nelly girl, come here, baby. If I, it's my wife, Chanel. Y'all give her a hand as she comes. Come here. All right. We talked all about hardships, and we know about hardships. We know about ups and downs, and we know about seasons and intense fellowship, right? We know, we know about that. We've been married 15 years. Um, we started dating in eighth grade. So every George Strait song was about us, basically. Check yes or no. That was us, okay? Um, I put maybe in there, too, because I still want to be friends, you know, just kind of keep you at a distance. But anyway, um, we know a lot about each other. We know a lot about life, know a lot about good, bad, and all the things that are going on. Um, and so to, to tell you only about the hardships of marriage, I want to I wanna bring life to the end of this. That if you want to have a great marriage, and we don't, we don't do this all the time, but I feel like I just have an example I want to give you. The Bible says in Ephesians 5, this is the one that everybody talks about, right? Specifically verse 22. 
Because in verse 22, it says, wives, submit to your husbands. And you've heard that, and every woman's skin just crawl right now, right? Because it's like submit. Oh, submit, oh, submit. And then it says, men, love your wives as Christ loved the church. So basically, men, if you love and lead the way you're supposed to love and lead, women will be honored to submit to you. The reason why they're not submitting in the way that that, that context is put is because you're not leading the way that you should. Why? Because you're being passive and not active. I hope all that just came together for you. But before it ever got to 22, verse 22, the context is verse 21. He says, submit to one another. Loving your wife as Christ loved the church is submission. Wives submit to your husband. That is submission. And in verse 21, before all of that is stated, he says in the context, I'm giving you what all this means. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. So Nellie, would you bow? Hey, so in the context of culture, in the context of the church, in the context of all the sermons you've heard and all the people that you've screened, uh, Ephesians 5.22, wives submit to your husband, this is what that context looks like. I'm the man. I know what's best. You do what I say. That, that's what you think marriage looks like. And women, you think this is what biblical marriage looks like. That's not what Paul is saying. He's saying submission is actually a little bit of a contest. That's the way we put it. A little bit of a contest. I am trying every day to outserve this woman. She's trying every day to outserve me. And in that context, I'm not doing this and looking down on her weak vessel you. I'm not, I'm not doing that. I'm down here with her, mutual submission, submitting to one another, talking to one another. Hey, how was your day? What's going on? Trying to understand feelings and emotions. She's, she's submitting herself to me, meeting my needs in all those ways. And as we do that, this mutual submission, my, my goal in life is to outserve her. We're competitive people. I want to outserve her. So you know what I do? I go a little bit lower. You know what she does? I, I just go a little bit lower. You know what she does? I just go a little bit lower. And when you get down here, good things can happen. Come on, somebody. <laughs> 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 love you um, but no seriously listen to me when you're in this position this is a ultimate position of submission and the Bible says all throughout that, that men and women would lay prostrate before God in a role of submission so ultimately when you are submitting to one another you're submitting to God when you're loving one another, you know what you're doing? You're loving God. When you serve one another, you know what you're doing? You're serving God. And in this manner, too many times we think, well, you know, I've, I've got to put my relationship with God over here and my relationship with my wife over here. No, 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 no. When you put God first and serve, as the Bible says, in this, in this position of mutual submission, you're actually serving God. Loving God and putting God first in your life. This is the posture of marriage. Not big and proud and, uh, no, no, no. This, this is the posture of marriage. When you go home, what does your marriage look like? How's your relationship? Are you doing it biblically? Or are you doing it the way culture or your grandfather or dad told you how to do it or mom or grandmother? Like, are you listening to family more than listening to the word of God? Because this is how marriage works. Mutual submission to each other and ultimately to God. Can we bow our heads and close our eyes just for a minute? I'm going to let Chanel get up. Come on, girl. I'm going to help you. Thank you, babe. Submission to each other turns into submission to God. Submission to God turns into submission to one another. That's marriage. That's life. That's biblical. That's the Lord. Maybe you're here today and you say, Pastor Nick, I, um, I'm not trying to give you a 30-minute fix-all message for the problems in your marriage and your relationships. I'm not, I can't do that. What I do want to do is I want to give you some concepts and starting talking points that when you go home today, on your way home, when you're going lunch, when you're having dinner, whatever it is, you, before you go to bed, you talk about, hey, what did you think about that today? And in that way... I feel like our marriages can be so much better. 
But maybe you're here today and the first relationship is your relationship with Jesus. That maybe you're married and you have kids and you've just gotten it out of order and that's fine. But I want to ask you today, is today the day where you surrender your life to Jesus? And that primary relationship that everything else hinges off of, I want to ask you, do you know Jesus? Have you put your faith, trust in him? Have you leaned on him in your life? Have you walked away from him? And where is your relationship with Jesus at right now? And if it's not where it needs to be, I want to give you an opportunity to get right today. I want to give you an opportunity to surrender your life to Jesus right now. So if you're in this room, if you're up in the overflow, heads bowed and eyes closed, you say, Pastor Nick, I need to get my life right with God. I need to make a fresh start. I need to give my life to Jesus. If that's you, I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to call you out. Whether you're down here or up at the chapel, would you lift up your hand and say, I need Jesus. I need to get right with God. Before I can fix my marriage, I've got to fix my relationship with him. If you're here in the overflow, you can raise your hand too. We'll be there to pray for you. Father, I thank you so much for the fact that when we submit to you, we're submitting to each other and submitting to each other submit to you. God, I'm so thankful that you've caused marriage, you created it, you created the man, the woman, the marriage, everything involved for our benefit, for our good, for our favor, for our blessing. And so God, today I'm asking that we would move forward and see our spouse as one of the greatest blessings that God could ever give us. I'm so thankful for what you're doing in our house, in our marriages. In Jesus' name, everybody say. Did you make a decision to accept Christ today? We would love to celebrate with you and provide you with some next steps in your newfound relationship with Jesus. You can do this by going to jefferson.church slash next steps. Are you interested in getting more connected or taking your next step at TJC? Follow us on social media and visit us at jefferson.church. Thank you for joining us online today. We hope you have a wonderful week and we can't wait to see you next Sunday at the Jefferson Church.